through our second pass through chapter 1, 2, and 3, and we're doing this, <clears throat> picking up something new every time, adding something. <clears throat> and um, our last pass through will be fairly quick when that comes, but we will pretty much hit every verse on some manner or right in a row. We'll just, we'll just go over it almost <laughs> like reading a, the book um, to see what it is that, that Paul is saying um, verse by verse. Chapter 2, last class we, uh, we were in verse 8. Let's go ahead and read verse 8 and 9, which none of the princes of this age knew, for had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, I hath not seen or ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. Um, <clears throat> so we were talking about this, uh, this wisdom of the world, this wisdom of this age, this uh, wisdom of man uh, this, that is caught up in um, gain and in position and gaining power and uh, you could call it how to succeed. And you got to remember this book is not just talking about any wisdom. It is talking about either the wisdom of God as the means of accomplishing the things of God or us thinking that this wisdom will accomplish the things of God because in reality... He's really not dealing with the wisdom of the world in the sense of this is the way the world is out there. It is, but that's really not what he's dealing with here. He's dealing with a division that has taken place within this particular church where some are lining up behind Paul and some are lining up behind Apollos and some Cephas and some this person and that person. And they, they have chosen different ones based on this wisdom that divides, whereas Christ's wisdom edifies and builds up and builds us together. And so, um, so he's, in, in a very real sense, when even though he calls it the wisdom of this age, uh, it is not the world way of thinking that he's actually dealing with. He's talking about the way you, the church, Corinth, the church at Corinth, the way you're thinking. And he's talking specifically about <clears throat> that situation. And, uh, but, but then he says, but none of the princes of this age, uh, they would have uh, not have crucified the Lord of glory had they understood this wisdom. And um, in our last class, we stated that only those who proceed by the wisdom of this age, only those who uh, proceed by the wisdom and power of this world would end up crucifying the weak. Not, I, notice I didn't say Jesus, but Jesus was the one that was weak. Jesus was the one who gave up his divine power and his authority and his resources of angels or just miraculous power to destroy the enemy or to and became the weak and that weakness included not just dying for us that's usually what we understand by that. But becoming weak enough where ruthless men, men of power, men of prestige, men of pride, can humiliate you, can brutalize you when he didn't have to succumb to that. But he became weak, and in that weakness, their wisdom rises to the top. 
It does then, it did then, and it will today. It will every time. <laughs> All right. Um, so ultimately, it was their ignorance of the wisdom of God that brought their downfall. Because, because they were ignorant of it, they didn't understand what's going on here. In fact, if anybody, you know, uh, you know, and they did tell them, you know, but I mean, you know, this is God. They would laugh and say, that's foolishness. This is just a man. Look, he's bleeding. He's, you know, this and that. Because they're blinded by their wisdom and they can only conceive of the weak as weak and the foolish as foolish when God says my weakness is power my foolishness is the wisdom of God there's no way they can conceive of that they fell into the trap of their own foolish mindset that couldn't go anywhere else with the situation. <clears throat> All right, and then, of course, verse 9, he's, then he says, but, as it is written, and he begins to talk about this, and um, uh, <clears throat> uh, this is actually a quote from Isaiah chapter 64, and uh, it is, I I'll just tell you, well, maybe we should turn there. Keep your place here, but let's go to Isaiah 64. Now, we think these prophets saw everything and knew everything and really saw the Lord, but the truth is they didn't. They were moved upon by the Holy Spirit and by the inspiration of God put all this down, and they didn't see everything as we think they did. They wrote the truth as it is in Jesus. They wrote Christ and him crucified. But they didn't fully understand everything that they wrote. And um, uh, let's start at verse 1. The actual verses are, I think, verse 5. But uh, verse 1. Oh, that thou wouldest rend the heavens, that thou wouldest come down, that the mountains might flow down at thy presence. As when the melting fire burneth, and the fire causeth the waters to boil, to make thy name known to thine adversaries, um, that the nations may tremble at thy presence. When thou didst terrible things which we look not for, thou camest down, and mountains flowed down at thy presence. For since the beginning of the world, men have not heard, nor perceived by the ear, neither hath the eye seen, O God, beside thee, what he hath prepared for them who waiteth for him. Um, I, I, unless that, that's it, it's verse 4. All right. The, and Paul, the writer of 1 Corinthians, chose this verse to prove that we don't see it. <laughs> he chose this verse to prove that we don't see it. I have not seen, ear hath not heard. The prophet is seeing, you know, all this stuff going on and the possibility of, you know, the Assyrians carrying them all away and all this kind of different things that he's seeing in the whole book. And, and so here he's... Um, uh, the, the subtitle above this, The Remnant's Prayer for Deliverance at the Return of Christ. And um, I don't know if that is fully the remnant or him because everything in front of that is him praying and his words. So those words are, oh, that thou wouldest rend the heavens. Okay, this is the wisdom of man. Rend the heavens and come down, that the mountains might flow down, that the whole mountain, these mountains would just literally start melting, and with the melting fire burneth, and the fire causeth the waters to boil, and to make thy name known to thine adversaries, 
that the nations may tremble. In other words, this is the power of man. This is not the power of God. This is not what he's been talking about up to this point. Do you agree? This is not what he's been talking about. He's been talking about Christ crucified. But now he's quoting a scripture, and, and then he says, verse 3, When thou didst terrible things which we look not for, thou camest down, and mountains flowed down in thy presence, for since the beginning of the world men have not heard nor perceived by the ear, neither hath the eye seen, O God, beside thee what he hath prepared for those who wait for him, and he's saying, Isaiah is presenting the reality that he doesn't even see it. He's the living testimony that he doesn't see it. That he's asking for power and might and God to rend the heavens and to affect the earth and do something so powerful that they'll all just go, oh, this is God. And then he says for I have not seen nor ear heard. And God's making come out of his very mouth the fact that he doesn't even get it. <laughs> All right, back to Corinthians. Folks, we don't get it either. I have not seen. Not them, not us. We're not going to get it. We're going to get the mind of Christ. We're not going to get it. You understand the difference? You know, you're not just going to, you're not going to just figure this thing out. God's mind must be in you. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. And so here he's been talking about this. I'm determined not to know anything but Christ and him crucified. But as it is written, I have not seen. And uh, so I wrote, um, this represents the hidden wisdom of God. It's a, um, and um, I, I failed to read after that. But after that is this picture where he, I mean, right after verse 4 in Isaiah 64, he starts talking about Israel being ravished and, and, and you know, raped and, and destroyed and the, the, the country coming under attack and all of this stuff happening. And, you know, these, the prophets looked at that stuff and, you know, many of them, I mean, like Habakkuk and others, this is, this is wrong, this is bad. But folks, it wasn't wrong and it wasn't bad. It was Christ crucified. All that it's talking about that's going to happen to them did happen to him and they were only a shadow. They weren't anything but a shadow of Christ crucified. But they're all freaking out and trying to avoid it. And they want God to come down and rend the heaven and do all this stuff and get them out of it. And he says, I have not seen. You have not heard. We don't get it. We see injustice. We see what the enemy deserves. Everything that is of the wisdom of man wants to do something about it except Jesus who bears it. Bears it for us and bears it for others. And their story, Israel's story, <coughs> was either just a story or their story actually was the story of Christ and him crucified. We have that choice. It can just be our story. We can just go through stuff. You can just go through stuff. It can just be all that you're going through can be totally worthless suffering. <laughs> Amen? You can, you can only, and there's nothing redeeming about it. You just, well, everybody suffers. Well, yeah, but not everybody fellowships in the sufferings of Christ and him crucified. And so the prophet didn't see, he didn't see that as Christ crucified, but he was inspired by the Holy Spirit to write it because all of that ravaging and all of that destruction is what happened to Jesus on the cross. And so that's why he's quoting it. 
That's why he's quoting it right there. He's using that as a, here's a, he's saying this is a perfect example. I have not seen, we don't even know. We keep referring back to the, this wisdom of this age and trying to get God to come in power and rejecting the power of weakness, rejecting the wisdom of foolishness. <clears throat> All right, so... Um, And, and I wrote, uh, no one sees the cross there, for I have not seen. <laughs> God, I mean, can you imagine Paul seeing this stuff and going, oh, Lord, he really saw Christ crucified. You know what? I mean, that man really genuinely saw it where I could never see it unless... That was revealed. <clears throat> All right. And then uh, we're still in uh, 1 Corinthians 2. Let's go to verse uh, 10 through 13. Um, but God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit, for the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. For what man knoweth the things of a man except the Spirit of a man which is in him? Even so the things of God knoweth no man but the Spirit of God. Now we have received not the Spirit of this world, but the Spirit of who is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given us of God, which things also we speak not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Spirit teacheth, comparing spiritual with spiritual, spiritual things with spiritual. Uh, in these verses, it is the spirit of that individual that reveals his true inner substance and essence. There's no way, because th see, this isn't, this isn't a teaching of information about God. This is either God or it's not. It's either the mind of Christ, not the thoughts of Christ. Do you understand what I'm saying? It's the mind of God. That, the mind of Christ is part of the essence of God. And you can't teach that. Only the spirit of God, only the spirit of man can convey what that man really is. His essence. Because that is his essence. And only the spirit of God can convey the spirit or the, the God's essence. So in these verses, it is the spirit of that individual that reveals his true inner substance and essence. It is God's spirit of the crucified that unveils the true nature of God. All of this is connected to the mind of Christ, which we find in verse 16. For who hath known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him, but we have the mind of Christ. Philippians 2, let this mind be in you which was in Christ Jesus, and there you see the uh, downward progression of the Lamb. That's the best way I know how to say it. All right. We're, again, we're just going quickly through this, and we'll hit on that a little more with our next pass. Chapter 3, 1 Corinthians 3. And let's look at one through five. <clears throat> Thy brethren could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, <clears throat> even as unto babes in Christ. I have fed you with milk and not with solid food or meat, for to this time you were not able to bear it, neither yet now are ye able. For ye are yet carnal, for... And how does he know that they're carnal? For whereas there is among you envying and strife and divisions, are you not carnal and walk as men? And to make sure they know what he's talking about, because we can say, you know, when you say, um, uh, you know, as long as there's envying and strife and divisions, we can say, they could say, uh, okay, well, I don't know what that means. I'm sure I'm not involved in that. <laughs> I, mean, I just know that my, I, I know our mind somehow. We just, little, 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 and then we just move that right out. Yeah. So, so he says, for while one saith I am of Paul and another I am of Apollos, are you not carnal? 
Now, I want you to know that he really harps on this Apollos Paul thing for, you know, you know, the first, at least the first three chapters where he really stays with that division and it bugs him, and, but he doesn't deal with it the way the, a regular minister of today's modern church would deal with. He deals with it the way an apostle of the crucified one would do that, and that is, this is not Christ crucified. That's it. That's what he sees. That's what he's impressed with. And his... his Approach is, you know, we have two, two groups here with two different mindsets. You know, those who like Neil Diamond and those who don't. Sorry, that's not the, I get mixed up on that one. But those who have the wisdom of this age and those who don't. And... He says, you're not just making decisions here. You think this is a light thing. You think, my God, of all the sin that's in Corinth, because, you know, Corinth was a rank city, folks. It was one of the most rank cities. Okay, it was bad. Of all the problems that are in this city, why are you attacking us, the church, making such a big deal out of, okay, well, you know, I, I kind of like Apollo, so I like Peter, you know, as a, a teacher. I like Paul. And Paul is just going, you don't even understand how much that violates the very Christ that you have been joined to because it's not Christ crucified. Well, he's right. I have not seen. <laughs> they don't, un my point is, they don't understand. They, they don't fully get that. They don't see, they don't see the depth of what's wrong with daily little choices and ways. They don't see it. All right, so as long as you don't see it, guess what? You're all right, right? <laughs> but I mean, that's, you know, what, what was the statement I was told in Bible school when I said something? The guy said, ignorance is bliss. This was a Christian guy. Deb's old boyfriend. <laughs> and Skip Haynes told me that he had the IQ of a genius. He told me that before, and then he says, ignorance is bliss. And I said, you're an idiot. I'm sorry. I, I was brand new. I hadn't even been saved, you know, a year, two years. But I mean, I already knew enough to know that's a, that's a stupid saying to say ignorance is bliss. Paul says, no, you not. I, you know, I would not have you ignorant, brethren. I mean, I would not have you ignorant, brethren. You know, everything that he taught and the way that he went about it was that we might not be ignorant and call it bliss. <laughs> so, um, but, but what is he trying to do? He's not trying to correct their knowledge. Wisdom of words will try to correct your knowledge. He's trying to exchange the wisdom of this age with the wisdom of God as seen in weakness and in foolishness. Christ crucified. He's, he's trying to make an exchange here and he's trying to get them to see the absolute difference between what they hold as okay or no big thing and what he sees as a violation of the very one who saved them. By what? By foolishness and weakness, by entering into that. All right? So, um, how far did I get on this? Um, yeah, I, I got all the way down to four. Let's go to five also. 
Who then is Paul, who is Apollos, but ministers by whom you believed, even as the Lord gave to every man? All right. In uh, chapter 1 through 5, Paul showed that he operated by the wisdom of the cross. I'm determined not to know anything, not to proceed on any basis but Christ and him crucified. I came to you in weakness. I appear foolish. And he does, folks. I'm telling you, check out the rest of the New Testament. And they, people mocked him for choosing Saul of Tarsus was a very educated man. He was not, he outdistanced all of his brethren in his zeal and his going after God, the God the, uh, of the Jewish religion, is the way he describes it. He was no fool, just, you know. He was not just some weakling. He stood out among the Pharisees that were in training, and he sat at Gamaliel's feet. All, all of this is clear cut, and there, all you got to do is study. For him to do what he did, to look foolish, is to go against every bit. Because he, he he's Saul of Tarsus. That may not mean much to you, but Tarsus was a Roman city, and he was a Roman citizen too. I mean, he had it all going for him. And so he lays all that down and says, I, I refuse to come to you with wisdom of words. What are you talking about? You're a scholar. He laid it all down because to him, the most important thing was not the message of Christ crucified, but the spirit and uh, nature of it filling his ministry guiding his words and and holding check on his temperament. So, let's put it that way. Yes. Um, he saw Stephen, you know, really release the spirit of Christ crucified. And, and I was thinking that Stephen was waiting on tables and waiting on the widows and he wasn't this great minister. He was just a servant. And um, I don't know, I think that Stephen really blew his mind because he just saw God and he saw that that was so different than what he had gained by being the top minister in Pharisee. And just blew his mind. For those watching this, if you wonder why I'm getting so fat, this is, this is it. I'm feeding my face. Butter finger. Well, before we go to Greg, I'd like to comment on what Kelly just said. She said, Stephen waited tables and he ministered to widows and um, instead of being, you know, some great person, and then he laid down his life, and he did. Um, and that he that Paul was greatly affected by him. I've al I've always said that, but I I now believe that it's possible. You know, because Paul never mentioned Stephen, but it doesn't it doesn't make any difference. It doesn't make any difference. But that the that the the power and the wisdom of weakness and death and foolishness was released toward Paul. And if he never knew where it came from, because I, I really believe that part of the, and not that that's the case in this case, but certainly in some cases, people never know where it came from. They don't know who died. They don't know who laid down their life. You know, and um, uh, so uh, I believe that either Paul was greatly affected by, because he was a young man, I'm, I'm agreeing with Kelly now, he was a young man and so was uh, Stephen. 
And he was trying to outdistance all of his brethren, but Philip looked like he was outdistancing all his brethren by taking, but in the midst of taking the lowest place. And God seemed to be blessing his sharing. And Paul must have probably, it's almost for sure, was in training under Gamaliel and all of the great teachers to have the best of the wisdom of words to impress and to, to deal with people. And yet, this guy, I can't explain it, but there's, you know, there's just a power, there's just a reality, you know. I mean, most, you know, most in this room, most of our first impression when we first were confronted with somebody preached in Christ and him crucified was two things. Number one, our heads kind of went, what, you know? And our spirit went, this is the truth. You know what I mean? I mean, that's, that's the normal, that's the normal way, okay? Um, or if he wasn't aware of Stephen, he was a recipient of the death and the selfless giving of Stephen without ever knowing. And wouldn't it be interesting? You know, he gets up to glory and there he is and then he goes, and God says, well, here's your benefactor. This guy, you know, we killed him. <laughs> you know, of course, that scenario probably won't happen like that, but I'm just, I'm, I'm trying to paint some pictures here so that you can see this thing at work. Greg, did you still remember what you were gonna share? Or? Oh, yeah, well, you know, it's kind of like good <laughs> what what you said was good too <laughs> we appreciate any opportunity to hear the wisdom of words i'm just kidding <laughs> <clears throat> all right i warned you i might do it again <laughs> all right so <clears throat> um try to follow these two sentences Paul showed that he operated by the wisdom of the cross. To not do so was the downfall of the princes of this world. All right. All right. The wisdom of the cross is down. The princes of this world are princes. Not princess, but princes. And princesses. And all of the above. <clears throat> Forget that. The, <laughs> the principle. <clears throat> okay, not that either. Okay. Jesus was the son of God. Came down and he's crucified. Son of God comes down and is crucified. Paul chooses, what, what was the wording I used? Paul showed that he operated by the wisdom of this cross. So he chooses this, he doesn't choose God who came down. He chooses Christ crucified. It's important. But then it says in this sentence that the princes... The, the ones who reign, the ones who rule, the ones who make the decisions, the ones who have the power. Let's see, what am I, did I get it mixed up? No, uh, the, I guess I should have gone the other way. The, the prince, uh, the, the prince, 
of this world, they got tripped up by it. To not do so was the downfall. This cross was their downfall. This ended their rule and their reign eventually. This brought them down. This brought us up into him, and then him threw us back down. I'm glad some of you get that. All right. Was that a hand up, or you just like? Okay, yes. Who did they hang upside down on the cross? Stephen. I mean, uh, Peter. That's what I thought. Yep. But, you know, that's just history. We don't, that's not in the Bible, so. Uh -huh. Okay, um, now in chapter 3, he shows a practical example of how they might put God's wisdom to work and defeat divisions in the body of Christ there. Their wisdom made them babies in the eyes of the Lord. Like small children, they were fighting and arguing over petty matters. There was a wisdom that had not yet, they had not yet attained unto <clears throat> that God counts as maturity. That's 2.14, 2, uh, for the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God for their foolishness unto him. <clears throat> Let me ask you a question. Is it possible to receive Jesus as your Savior and yet consider Christ crucified as foolish? Okay, let me word, reword it. Let's, you know, is it possible to believe in the crucifixion of Christ while rejecting Christ crucified? Do you all understand what I'm saying there? Because you can, you can believe in that Christ was crucified, and what that means is that he died so that you don't go to hell and so that you're not punished and everything's laid on him and I'm free. And when confronted with Christ crucified as the potential for how you proceed in your ministry, for the kind of wisdom or mind that you have and for how and what you believe to truly bring about change, they could consider it foolish. All right. What we've just described here is the Corinthian church. They're all saved. I mean, as far as what we understand salvation to be, they believe that Christ was crucified on a cross for their sins. <clears throat> but the reason why they can't get along, the reason why there are divisions in the church is because they don't see it as his body. They see it as an organization. They don't see it as his life in them, his body. You understand what, how I'm wording that? <clears throat> and how the, they see the salvation cross as an event, and in a certain sense it is. They don't see the cross as the eternal expression of the Godhead. They don't see it. They don't see that. They don't see God. They see themselves when they look at the cross. Do you understand what I mean by that? Meaning they see what they get from it. So they only see the cross in relationship to them as to how it benefits them. Okay, well, I'm not, I'm not slamming that. I'm not, I, you know what I mean? By God, I'm saved too, and I'm happy about it, okay? I mean, I'm not, you know, <laughs> I mean, I'm genuinely glad I'm not going to hell. Really? No, no, I am. And that, you know, I'm not going to be punished for my sins, for they were many, and they were. <laughs> but, That doesn't, that doesn't bring about a greater intimacy with God through Christ except on a thankfulness basis.
but the kind of intimacy that the New Testament declares, folks, is that God is your father and you're of that seed. But we say, well, God's my father, so, you know, here we go, I'm a king's kid. You know, you know so I'm going to get everything a king's kid. How about getting your father's nature? I'm getting sick of you. I'm going to come back. Don't make me. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> All right. Um, so they had not yet attained unto a wisdom that God counts as maturity, that specific wisdom which God counts as maturity is Christ crucified. That's what this is talking about. Now, while we're still just covering over this, in our next pass, we're going to really see this wisdom at work, okay? We're really, really, really going to see it at work. But it's important that I say to you right now that, the, that what the natural man doesn't receive here and the carnal man doesn't get, but let's, let's just keep it right now with verse 14 of the second chapter with the natural man. What he doesn't get isn't God. It's not that he doesn't get God. It's not that the carnal man doesn't get God as far as deity. But this says, but the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. <laughs> Folks, that is exactly what he's been preaching in the first and second chapter. Clearly, the Christ crucified is what's foolish to them. Not salvation. These guys believe in it. But to talk to me about living this sort of way, now that's foolish. And even to consider in the, in the most real way, uh, I, I can somehow believe that Jesus came and he died for my sins. But when you spell it out in the way that you do it, you're, you're saying that the way God did this thing, out of all of the options that are at God's disposal, he decided to just come down here and die and, and to put himself in a position where those things could happen to him and that somehow that's the wisdom of God. Now that's foolishness. That's what he's, he's not just saying, well, the natural man is unsaved and so he doesn't know. He's not saying the carnal guy is just so, so young that he doesn't get it. He's saying they're not getting the cross and that spiritual maturity is the mind of Christ, Philippians 2. Let this mind be in you, not just believe it, not just see it in Jesus. Let it be in you. Is this, I mean, is the, is the do we feel like we're walking on a path here together? Because this is, you know, and, and again, we'll make a couple more paths on this road and we'll widen it and, and, and clear it a little more. But it, even if you... Even if you don't believe what I just said, and I think that you do, but even if you didn't, um, at least hear what I'm saying that these scriptures are saying instead of what we've always been taught. And frankly, I'm the guy that taught you. Can you believe that I have taught you wrong on some things? Well, I have. And I repent, and I'm sorry. I never did it on purpose. I just didn't see the fullness of Christ. I'm yet seeing the fullness of Christ. I only want to give you this beautiful son and the reality of him. But I didn't because I didn't see it. And for that, I genuinely apologize, and I ask your forgiveness. But I ask you at the same time, for more than forgiveness and for more than, you know, realizing that I fail and I have failed you at times and that sort of thing. But to be open, to be open to even more of Christ and to see this in the true light of the scriptures that are going 
line upon line, precept upon precept in that sense here. Okay. Yes, sir. You knew it. And we forgive you. I forgive you. For you've done nothing wrong. You keep going. I'll shut up. Well, I appreciate your heart. However, you know, the good news is I'm seeing the Lord and I can, you know, you know, forgetting those things which are behind. I'm pressing toward the mark and I know that you are with me. But you but I'm saying this to make to let you know that I don't see everything, and, and even though I love Jesus, and even though I diligently search the scriptures and cry out to God, I am not fully matured in everything yet, but I am pressing towards the mark, and I want that, and I believe that's your heart too, so I don't feel alone. I feel like we're all in this together, but I, I, I feel like it's my responsibility to let you know when you know, I've fallen short or messed up or, you know, didn't share right with you. I, again, would never do that intentionally or try to deceive. It was the understanding I had of the Lord at that time. So, so anyway, this, this specific wisdom that God is talking about, that these guys count as foolishness, is Christ crucified. And so that what the natural man is not receiving is Christ crucified. And what the carnal man is is uh doesn't fully understand is that it's not just jesus crucified christ crucified for my sins it is the mind of christ that transforms us from the wisdom of this world to the wisdom of weakness and foolishness praise god <laughs> and it's all and it all sounds so crazy it sounds foolish to say it, but it is, it is what Paul's preaching, and it is, you know, what I'm, I'm learning. All right, um, Paul has shown how the wisdom of this world takes sides. I'm of Paul, I'm of Apollos, and through it divides or tears down the temple. Yes. Chapter 3, um, you, you can read it, and we, we discussed it in the end of the tabernacle class, but it is the same reality, <clears throat> um, and we'll see how we go from here. But uh, let's see. So, but this, this wording is important. You know, you know, I just repented to you, and I get to again right now, that quickly. I, I do, because... I told you at the end of the tabernacle class that the thing that divides um, or, or the thing that tears down the temple is divisions. And I was wrong. <laughs> but luckily that hadn't been that long ago <laughs> and I can correct it. But I was wrong. I, as I was searching, I think yesterday, I realized, I saw it the way that he was saying it. I went, oh my God, he's not saying that division divides. He's saying that the wisdom of this world, when it operates in us, causes us to pick and to choose, and that causes divisions, and that's what tears down and destroys the church, if you will. The temple of God. That's what, that wisdom. That's why he keeps harping on, harping, harping on this thing of, Christ crucified, and we keep thinking that that's foolish because we're trying to find, I want to pick the greatest one. I mean, can you see, you know, I am of Paul, I'm of Paulus, I am of Peter. One of them says, I'm of Christ. And, you know, the one who says, I'm of Christ, feels the most spiritual. And he's not. He's not because he's still dividing, as it were, the temple. <clears throat> All right. So Paul has already pointed out that this kind of wisdom makes void the cross of Christ or the wisdom of God, and that's chapter 1, verse 17. I don't come to you with wisdom of words because if I do, that voids out the cross of Christ, okay? Um, the goal is not the goal is not that of lining up behind a particular man or even of Christ unless it is Christ crucified. Amen. 
You can't just line up a, 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 and see, Peter was of God. Paul was of God. Apollos was of God. This is not a situation of lining up behind Zeus or some high priest of his temple. Or You see what I mean? I mean, Paul, you make the biggest deal over the smallest thing. We're not following Zeus. We're following the best men of God on the planet. And, you know, and one guy says, and we're, you know, in our little group over here, we're following Christ. We're not following Paul or Peter. And Paul is saying, no, you don't line up behind any of those, not even Christ. You line up behind Christ crucified. That's what he's saying. That's the wisdom of God. And anything else they're going to think is foolishness. <clears throat> All right. So he makes this clear about himself in chapter 3 and presents himself as an example of this way. This master builder is building all living stones on one foundation. And he's already told you what he's determined not to know, not to preach. He's told you that it's Christ crucified. So you can be assured that that foundation is what? Christ crucified, because that's all he preached. And he said, I laid the foundation. So there's no question that when he talks about the foundation, he's not talking about foundational principles of salvation. I have laid the foundational principles of salvation and so that you will have assurance that you're saved. Not this guy. Not this guy. He is determined not to know anything among them but Christ and him crucified. And he said, I came there and I laid this foundation. And anybody else that comes, including Peter, including Apollos, they're supposed to be building on top of this. Right? Isn't that the, the true meaning of that? Uh, so the master builder is building all the living stones on one foundation, Christ crucified. How do we know this? Because he is a wise master builder. And the wisdom is talking about is the wisdom of God in a mystery, Christ crucified. By using the word wise, he is telling them, I built on the wisdom that you call foolishness. And the weakness, that, the strength that you call weakness. <clears throat> All right, so, um, because he is a wise master builder and the wisdom he builds on is Christ crucified, the wisdom and power of God as already established in the first chapter. You got to, just like he builds on a foundation, you got to build on the first chapter, the second chapter, the third. You never leave those things. Those should always be established. All right, Paul made it clear that there's no other foundation than this, and that's, um, uh, let's read uh, chapter 3, verse 10 and 11. According to the grace of God, which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, and, an, and another buildeth on it. All right, remember, what is he talking about? Him, Apollos. But let every man take heed how he buildeth upon it. For other foundation can no man lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. All right, so Paul made it clear that there's no other foundation than this. Then what? <clears throat> All right. Therefore, whatever materials they use in the building, in the temple, it is, it is correct to say at this time, whatever materials they use in the building, I'll explain my difference later. But there is a difference at this point in the discussion. Uh, whatever materials that they use in the building, it is firmly established that all must build and lay what they have on the foundation of Christ crucified. <laughs> that's, what he's, that's what he's telling them. What do the materials such as wood, hay, and stubble represent? They represent placing contrary materials into the temple that are not going towards forming the temple as a habitation of God. So Jesus is two things, foundation 
an inhabitor of the temple. Be careful what you build. Chapter 3, 18 through 20. So uh, verse 18. Let no man deceive himself. If any man among you seemeth to be wise in this age, let him become a fool, that he may be wise. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. For it is written, he taketh the wise in their own craftiness. And again, the Lord knoweth the thoughts of the wise, that they are vain. All right, so um, in chapter 3, 18 through 20, the so-called wise must become and join the ranks of the fools who preach and live by the cross. <laughs> and that's, that's the invitation by saying that. And that's God's invitation. Where are we at? Well, how much time we got left? Um, let me just finish one other statement. Um, and we'll stop. Oh, gosh. We're so close. All right. Um, uh, look in chapter 4, verse... Uh, Six, real quick, just a quick jump ahead. And these things, brethren, I have in a figure transferred to myself and to Apollos for your sakes, that you might learn in us not to think of men above that which is written, that no one of you be puffed up for one against the other. So he's saying all this that he's written so far about the wisdom of God and about the, the cross and the weakness of God and, and the, the foolishness of, the, of Christ crucified. He's saying, you know what, all of, I'm saying all of this, all this depth, it's not depth. It's, it's Christ crucified or it's not. It's not depth. I'm not teaching you doctrine. I'm telling you either live by Christ crucified or... You're living by the knowledge, of the wisdom of this world that seem, because they, they call themselves the wise. The wisdom of, I have made foolish, the wisdom of the wise. They think they're wise. And he says over in the scriptures we just read before this, let the wise become fools, meaning let them embrace Christ crucified. And so he's saying, look, all of this, everything I'm saying is not about making you deep and spiritual. It's about you guys need to start aligning your lives the way Jesus did and the way God dealt with you as a Corinthian church, which we'll get into next time, possibly. And, uh, and, and how you are supposed to live. It's all Christ crucified. All right, so um, let's see. Let me just read, make sure I got there. Yeah. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you for your Holy Spirit who is our teacher and is the only one who will be able to communicate these things. No words, no specialty words and presentation is going to do that. But your spirit is the only one who has this by essence. Impart to us the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. May we have the mind of Christ. May we live by it. May we yield. May we let. Instead of trying to by the wisdom of man, figure out a better way, a more efficient way, a more practical way. May we just let, may we yield, may we surrender to Christ crucified. So we trust you, Holy Spirit. We trust your abilities as the gift given to the church to know Jesus the one with whom we are one and to become after his kind thank you thank you father thank you for your son thank you 
son for going to the cross in such a manner that we could discover God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We bless you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, we're dismissed.